We share in health care at least two unfortunate distinctions with the Republic of South Africa. One is that we're the only two nations that don't have universal health insurance for our populations among developed countries. And the other is that we're the only two nations that keep health statistics by race, but not by class or income. But uh, if one asks the Canadian public, as the Harris Organization did, do you face substantial barriers in getting the medical care that you need? One-tenth as many Canadians as Americans say they face financial barriers to care. But I think even more surprising is that half as many uh, Canadians as Americans say that they face non-financial barriers like queues for services, unavailability of technology equipment, and so on. Uh, about half of the total difference in spending on health care, and Canada spends about $1,200 per person less than we do each year, about half of that $1,200 difference is accounted for by the excess bureaucracy that is in our system in essence to keep the private insurance industry in business and to enforce inequality and access to health services. Winston Churchill said that you can always rely on Americans to do the right thing uh, after they've exhausted all of the other possibilities. There have been a lot of misinformation and outright lies concerning health care in this country and the health care system in Canada. Well, we're going to try to do something about that in our small way by providing you with some good information right now on Alternative Views. Dr. David Himmelstein from Harvard Medical School made a presentation in New York City about the American and Canadian systems of health care. Public access producer Joe Friendly made a program about this and is sharing his information and his tape with us on alternative views. We have at any moment in this country about 35 million uninsured and if you look over a longer period, as the Census Bureau did a couple of years back, over a two and a quarter year period, there are 63 million Americans who are uninsured for at least one month. Uh, another 40 to 50 million who have coverage, but such poor coverage that if they were actually sick, they would be bankrupted by that illness. So it's a problem that cuts very broadly across our society, even for seniors, virtually all of whom covered by Medicare, they now spend more of their income for medical care out of pocket than they did before Medicare was passed in the mid-60s, 18 percent of the average income of persons over 65 going for medical care costs not covered by Medicare. And virtually no one in this country covered adequately for long-term care. Only 1 percent of Americans with insurance that would cover long-term no nursing home care uh, if they were ill. Uh, except in the case that they were bankrupted and then became eligible for Medicaid once they'd spent all of their lifetime savings. And one sees the evidence of crisis in people who are well insured, that now many people, according to the New York Times, about 20 percent of Americans saying they stay at an unwanted job because of fear of losing their health insurance benefits were they to change jobs. Uh, and of course the other side of the crisis in health care is the rising cost that Vic Seidel spoke of. Uh, we now spend about 14.5 percent of gross national product on medical care. Uh, it'll be over a trillion dollars next year alone for medical care, about 930 billion this year, and rising at the most rapid rate uh, of rise of health care costs in our history, despite 20 years of government policy supposedly aimed at cost control with DRGs and HMOs and PPOs and a variety of other alphabet soups, uh, 
our costs rising faster today than ever before in history. And the consequences of the rising costs and declining coverage are extraordinarily evident in our society. Uh, when I was a, a resident at the City Hospital in Oakland, the event that really started my advocacy work on this issue was a, a young woman hit by a truck and uh, taken to a fully equipped private hospital where we, she was refused medical care because of a negative wallet biopsy, no insurance card found. Uh, transferred 40 miles across the county in an ambulance where we discovered six long bone fractures, a fractured pelvis, and a ruptured aorta. Uh, she miraculously survived to discharge from the hospital, but we found 18 other patients who were refused care in fully equipped hospitals because they couldn't pay and died as a result of it in one six-month period in Oakland and Berkeley, California. And that's the tip of the iceberg. A large number of less dramatic events that in the long run probably no less important. So, uh, Vic has referred to our work on the lack of preventive services, uninsured women about half as likely to get routine pap tests and screening blood pressure checks as comparable insured women and in the long term that clearly causes death and disability. Our prenatal care record, now the worst of any developed nation, only about 70% of American women getting fully adequate prenatal care in this country. And we've actually gone downhill over the past decade in that statistic. Uh, and the first time since we've been keeping statistics in this country that we've had a worsening of measures of access to care like adequacy of prenatal care. The infant mortality rate in many communities in our country actually rising over the past decade. The, the uh, post-neonatal mortality rate for black infants, for instance, higher today than it was in 1980. The maternal mortality rate for black women higher today than in 1980. The overall death rate for black women at the same level today as 10 years ago. The first time in the 70 years we've been keeping such statistics that we've had a decade without progress. And for black men, actual retrogression shorter life expectancy today than in 1980, and men living in Harlem now have a shorter life expectancy than men living in Bangladesh. The uh, disturbing feature, I think, uh, of that is evident, and uh, I think some audiences hear that statistic and they say that may apply to, to blacks, but not to broader groups in our society is, is a particularly narrow uh, issue. Uh, one, I think, ought to recognize the racism in that statement, uh, but also that we must use statistics about the African-American community in this country to tell us more broadly what's going on in poor and working class communities, because we share in health care at least two unfortunate distinctions with the Republic of South Africa. One is that we're the only two nations that don't have universal health insurance for our populations among developed countries. And the other is that we're the only two nations that keep health statistics by race, but not by class or income. And we have to use the statistics about what's going on in the black community to, to tell us more broadly uh, what's occurring among uh, poor and oppressed communities in this country. The flip side of the uh, inadequacies in care uh, are that we have uh, We've heard, I, I guess, about rationing in other countries, um, but in effect, we're rationing care in this country, it's been said, though one of my friends, when I said that to him, uh, pointed out to me that the dictionary defines rationing as an egalitarian distribution of a scarce resource. And we don't distribute medical resources in anything like an e egalitarian manner. And even more striking, they're not scarce, these resources are in abundance in our society. In fact, we do substantial amounts of work in my profession uh, that probably do more harm than good to, for patients. The RAND Corporation in California uh, studied uh, coronary artery bypass surgery, one of the most commonly performed operations in our country. And they found that 14% of the, all of the operations they reviewed were clearly unnecessary did more harm than good. They found six patients who'd undergone this surgery who had normal preoperative tests, had normal coronary arteries, and yet had them replaced. And if you do that outside an operating room, that's assault and battery with a deadly weapon. And we 
have every day in this country 300,000 empty hospital beds, more hospital beds empty in the United States than in the entire continent of Europe every day. And we're told that we have a growing surplus of medical personnel. So that, in effect, our health policy has really focused on rationing a surplus of medical capability. And if you think about that for a moment, that's really an oxymoronic phrase, rationing a surplus. It's a little bit like political leadership over the last 15 years. Uh, but in effect, that's what we've been doing. And it, of course, takes a great deal of effort to keep sick patients out of empty hospital beds. And the most rapidly rising portion of our healthcare labor force over this period has been bureaucrats and administrators who just do just that, keep sick patients out of empty hospital beds. Um, that's really the, the bad news part of my talk, and the, frankly, the biggest regret I have about not being able to show you slides is that at this point I would show you pictures of my children. Um, one of them frowning to illustrate the bad news part of my talk, and the other now smiling to uh, show you that I'm going to get on to the better news, and that is that something rather simple and straightforward can be done about the crisis that we're in. Uh, in effect, over the past 25 years in North America, we've been carrying out parallel health policy experiments on our side of the border, leaving intact the existing private insurance mechanism uh, and adding to it patches for the poor, Medicaid, for the elderly, Medicare, city and state and county programs in some areas. Uh, but the fundamental system of private health insurance has remained at the core of our system. And at about the same time we passed Medicare and Medicaid in this country, the Canadians passed a national health insurance program, which is really a rather simple one. The federal government in Canada offered the provinces block grant funds, uh, initially matching funds, later block grant funds, uh, for any program that met the following criteria. It had to be universal in coverage. That is, the public provincial program had to cover at least 98% of the people in the province they had to have evidence of that by having their names on a plastic card. Um, second, it could not impede access to care by financial or other barriers. And what that really means is no co-payments, no deductibles for any covered services. Uh, third is that it had to be portable from province to province. If you were from Ontario and got sick in Quebec, you had to be covered. Uh, fourth was that it had to be comprehensive in its benefits that the federal government didn't further define, but all of the provinces have very comprehensive acute care coverage. There's some variability on long-term care, prescription drugs, and outpatient eyeglasses. Um, but all of them have comprehensive acute care pro uh, programs. And the final requirement was that they all had to be uh, administered by a not-for-profit, publicly accountable agency. And that came because of the early experience in the province of Saskatchewan, which first passed this program in the early 50s, um, which found that uh, administering the program through a private insurance company cost four times as much as public administration. And it wasn't anxious to waste that money and decided, therefore, to do it in the public sector. And I'll get back to some of our experience on that issue in this country. The evidence on the Canadian program is by now really rather clear. Before the passage of national health insurance in Canada, their death rates were higher than ours. Within five years of its passage, their death rates fell to be lower than ours and have remained substantially lower. If one looks at the proportion of patients who have serious medical problems who actually get in to see a doctor, there was a 30% increase in one year after the passage of that program in people who needed to see a doctor and actually did see a doctor. No other changes in the medical care system in that year. If one asks Canadian physicians, do you think that this program Im has improved the health of the Canadian population, they say overwhelmingly that they do. If one asks the Canadian population, are you satisfied with your medical care and with our medical care system here in Canada, they say by margins of 90% and more that they are indeed happy. Uh, and by a variety of measures, Canadians get more medical care uh, than we do in this country. The New York Times uh, had an article on Sunday, one of a series that's appeared in the U.S. press, about 
problems in Canadian medical care, uh, rife with errors, for instance, about co-payments at Canadian laboratories for routine tests. That's against federal law in Canada. It may go on because it hasn't yet been caught, but were those laboratory operators caught, they would be prosecuted as uh, having committed a federal offense. Um, but uh, if one asks the Canadian public, as the Harris Organization did, do you face substantial barriers in getting the medical care that you need? One-tenth as many Canadians as Americans say they face financial barriers to care. But I think even more surprising is that half as many uh, Canadians as Americans say that they face non-financial barriers like queues for services, unavailability of, of high technology equipment and so on. The insurance industry has spent $30 million this year informing us of problems in Canadian medical care. Uh, and I think the surveys suggest that they would better spend that money in Canada because the Canadians are unaware of those problems. Um, but they persist. Um, Canadians, as I said, get more doctor visits uh, than we do. Uh, Canadian seniors over the age of 65, as compared to Americans over the age of 65, all of whom are covered by Medicare, uh, have comparable rates of hospitalization for high-tech cardiac-related procedures. Canadians get uh, more liver transplants, more uh, heart and lung transplants, and uh, interestingly, more bone marrow transplants per capita than we do. Paul Songus ran for president last year and when questioned said he would oppose a Canadian style national health insurance program because under it he wouldn't have been able to get his bone marrow transplant which was a surprise to the doctors in Canada who developed that procedure uh, and to the doctors in Canada who do more of them than doctors in this country do. Um, they have a longer average length of hospital stay than we do. Uh, and I think most surprising to most Americans, at least those of us who remember this debate last time around, the main argument used against national health insurance in this country was we couldn't afford it. And uh, in 1965, before Canada's program was passed, they spent the same proportion of gross national product on health care as we did, and they now spend 9%, we now spend 14.5%. Their costs flattened out as their program came into effect and ours skyrocketed. Uh, where are the differences in spending between the two countries? Uh, about half of the total difference in spending on health care, and Canada spends about $1,200 per person less than we do each year. About half of that $1,200 difference is accounted for by the excess bureaucracy that is in our system in essence to keep the private insurance industry in business and to enforce inequality and in access to health services. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on this, both because I think it's important and because it's my particular line of research. Uh, we have 1,200 insurance companies in this country, and the average, they take about 14 cents of every insurance premium dollar for their overhead. So for every dollar you pay to an insurance company, 86 cents worth of care comes out. Uh, for every dollar that Canadians pay into their national health insurance program, 99.3 cents comes out. They have less than 1% overhead in their public program. And we have similar experience in this country. Three cents on the dollar is spent on overhead in Medicare versus 14 cents on the dollar in private insurance programs. To give you a sense of the scale of that inefficiency in private health insurance, Blue Cross Blue Shield in my state of Massachusetts employs 6,682 people. That's to administer the coverage for 2.5 million residents of Massachusetts. And that's more people than work for the entire Canadian National Health Insurance Program in all 10 provinces to administer the coverage for 27 million Canadians. Uh, it's been said that managed care is more efficient. In fact, the data doesn't bear that out. Managed care plans have at least high, as high overhead as uh, other forms of private insurance. Prudential's managed care plan in New Jersey that insures 110,000 people, employs 125 clerks, six full-time physician reviewers, 17 full-time nurse reviewers, and 57 additional clerical personnel just to administer the coverage for 110,000 people. That's 
as many people doing clerical and utilization review work on that plan as there are doctors needed to deliver the services to those people enrolled. Uh, and it's not just the overhead of the insurance companies that's siphoned out of our system as administrative waste. It's enormous overhead. We will spend this year about $45 billion in health insurance company overhead. Almost 1% of our gross national product will go for health insurance companies' overhead costs. But they do much more than that. In my hospital, small 200-bed hospital, we have to bill 450 different insurance plans uh, that cover our patients. And we have to keep track of who got every Band-Aid and aspirin tablet at our hospital in order to know who to send the bill to. And the way we do that is that every Band-Aid that comes into our hospital gets an individually numbered tag. Uh, there are six full-time people in the basement who, uh, in our supply room who put those individually numbered tags on everything that comes in. And um, I have a slide of a nurse and I just having finished putting an IV in a patient. She's got the little billing stickers, the result on her dress. And she'll go put them on the patient's chart, which goes down to the hospital basement, where we have seven clerk typists uh, who type in those billing numbers to our million-dollar billing computer that prints out one of those 12-page long bills to send to Blue Cross, who, of course, has a staff to try not to pay it. And they eventually send it to the patient who uh, then brings it to me and we spend half of our visit together discussing the bill. The inefficiency of that really came home to me visiting a friend hospitalized at what was then called Toronto General Hospital, since renamed Toronto Hospital. 900 bed, tertiary care, specialty hospital, full range of services. And uh, he asked us to go to the billing office there and uh, settle up his bill. He was an American. And we went to the billing office at Toronto General, which consisted of three people and a filing cabinet as their major piece of equipment. Uh, and their main job was to send bills to Americans who wandered across the border, because Canadian hospitals don't bill individual patients. Everybody in Canada has the same insurance, and therefore hospitals are paid as a fire department is paid in this country. They negotiate an annual budget for all of their work and they get one-twelfth of that budget every month in the mail as a check from the provincial health insurance program. When we got back to Boston, we went to Massachusetts General Hospital, 900 bed, full range of specialty services hospital, and at that time, Mass General had 352 full-time equivalent personnel in its billing department, and $3 million worth of billing computer equipment. They spent more money on stamps to send out bills than Toronto General spent on its entire billing operation in a year. And that's typical. It's not just Mass General. In fact, if a hospital doesn't make that expenditure, they go out of business because that's the only way you can collect your fees as a hospital and stay in business. The average American hospital is now spending about 24 percent of total hospital revenues on billing and administration, and the average Canadian hospital is about 9 percent. That's a huge difference. For doctors, a, a similar kind of hassle. My group practice, we pay a billing service 10% of our gross receipts to do our billing, and that's typical for American doctors. The uh, average Canadian doctor spending about 1% of their income to do their billing. The result of that is that the cost of keeping the private insurance industry in the middle of our healthcare system amounts to such a high cost uh, the General Accounting Office of Congress, I, I think in a very conservative estimate, says 10% of our gross health expenditures could be saved each year by going to a Canadian-style system. This year that means $93 billion. Next year, $100 billion. That's enough, again, according to the General Accounting Office, to cover everyone who doesn't have insurance and everybody who has only partial insurance with no net increase in our health spending. If we just take the money out of the bureaucracy and devote it to giving care to people, the resources are in our system already to do that. The uh, requirement, of course, is a direct confrontation with the insurance industry. And uh, that is undoubtedly politically difficult. And that has led to the major alternative, which is now on the table, um, often called managed competition. We refer to it as mangled competition. Uh, it's actually a plan with an interesting history. The term managed competition uh, 
was first coined by Robert McNamara when he was the president of Ford Motors in the late 1950s. And uh, McNamara used this term to describe the uh, internal competition among divisions at Ford for the company's resources. And he brought the term with him to the Defense Department where he used it as his guiding principle in reorganizing defense procurement during the Vietnam period and to guide strategy uh, in the Vietnam War, uh, the overall strategy making. And uh, McNamara's chief lieutenant in the Defense Department, the person who was the kind of ringleader for the whiz kids, so-called at that time, was a young economist named Alan Enthoven. Uh, Alan Enthoven later went on to be a professor at uh, Stanford Business School and a health economist who designed the managed competition scheme using the lessons he learned in that early defense procurement uh, uh, experience. It's a, an extraordinarily complex scheme that I think hides uh, some basic power relations. And they may be best brought out by a quote from William Link who's uh, the uh, executive vice president of Prudential's health insurance division, who said that of the uh, options for reform on the market, on the table, managed competition would be best for Prudential. In fact, even better than the current situation. Um, <laughs> under managed competition, uh, essentially everyone would be under severe financial pressure to move into the lowest cost plan available in their area. Anything above that lowest cost health insurance plan uh, would be purchased with after-tax dollars and essentially your employer would be forbidden to contribute towards that coverage. Uh, the concept is that Americans are too inured to health costs, that we don't feel them enough, and what we need to do is make people <coughs> feel their health care costs more directly and therefore make them more cautious as they purchase health insurance and think more about the costs. Uh, there are all kinds of mechanisms for exactly how to drive people into these lowest cost plans. The uh, anticipation is that virtually all of them will be uh, insurance company operated HMOs that your employer will play a large role in deciding which of those insurance company operated HMOs you shall enroll in, and that fee-for-service medicine and ability to choose doctor will essentially be abolished for at least 90 percent of the population. Um, there are, I think, at least, of, at least several problems with this approach. Um, Perhaps the gravest is that there's no evidence at all that it'll work and considerable evidence that it won't, even on the grossest, uh, let's say, on its own terms. Uh, managed care plans have not yet contained costs despite 20 years of experience. HMO costs have gone up at the same rate as indemnity insurance policy costs uh, and continue to do so as of last week when we had the latest reports. Uh, second is that for the vast majority of Americans, this means a doctor chosen for them by their employer, in essence. Uh, and I don't think that most people view that as a positive uh, change in our health care system. Third is that the presumption underlying it is that Americans uh, already get too much care and are too well insulated from their medical costs. That ignores the data that we, in fact, get less medical care than the people of virtually any other developed nation, shorter hospital stays and less days in the hospital than virtually all of the European nations as well as Canada, fewer doctor visits per person than virtually all of the, Canadi uh, of the European nations in Canada, and even less of many high-tech procedures than people in other nations, and that we pay much higher out-of-pocket po costs than any other nation. Uh, and yet we lead the world in health care costs, so that the logic behind the strategy, I think, is, is clearly lacking. Um, and yet the administration takes it seriously, and I think the, the reason is clear. And at this point in my talk, I usually show a, a picture of the Boston skyline. And those of you who know our city will know that the two tallest buildings in our skyline are Prudential and John Hancock. Uh, and Mrs. Clinton uh, is clearly responding to those interests. And in our meeting two weeks ago, she made it very clear that she was cognizant of those interests and that the key question she faced is the politics of, is it possible to confront such a powerful force? And the impression is that 
Her answer is it is not. Um, one hopes she'll learn otherwise soon. I guess I, I heard the story that uh, Chelsea Clinton was ill uh, last week at uh, her uh, private school in, uh, in Washington, Sydenham, uh, Sidwell Friends, and went to the nurse, and um, the nurse uh, wanted to give her some treatment and needed parental permission and asked her how to get in touch with her mother, and she said, gee, my mom is awfully busy. I think you'd better call my father. <laughs> Apparently a true story. So I, I hope Mrs. Clinton will discover otherwise, but at this point um, her task force is heavily stocked with, uh, with I guess what's now called policy wonks committed to uh, the insurance company's strategy, having now been funded, most of them, for the last 25 years for their academic work by the insurance company's uh, grants. Um, the alternative, as, as uh, Vic Seidel has said, however, enjoys substantial support, uh, at least some of America's industrial firms. He's referred to the fact that there's now more health care than steel in an American automobile, and Chrysler is well aware of that. And the, the data that he quoted of Chrysler paying about $500 more per car for health care in the United States than in Canada is not a comparison with of Chrysler with Mitsubishi, that's Chrysler in Detroit with Chrysler in Windsor, Ontario. In 1988, 60 percent of Americans said they would prefer that. By 1992, uh, 70 percent of Americans said they'd prefer that. In fact, the exit polls showed that a single-payer approach was more popular than either the approach advocated by George Bush or that advocated by Bill Clinton. And that, despite the fact that no one on the national scene campaigned on that uh, program. If you ask Canadians, by the way, the symmetrical question, and again, the Harris Organization did this, and they asked something like, uh, in the U.S., uh, most people have coverage by their from their employer. Uh, the elderly, the poor, and disabled uh, have coverage by the government, which actually isn't true. A minority of the uh, poor and disabled have coverage through the government. Uh, People can choose their own doctors and hospitals, which actually also isn't true. Most Americans are now enrolled in managed care plans that restrict their choice of doctor and hospital. And on balance, would you prefer that to what we have here in Canada? And Canadians know that system well. It's what they had before theirs was enacted, and they watch our television, read our magazines, and 3% are prepared to go back to a U.S.-style system of care which one of my Canadian colleagues pointed out to me is their illiteracy rate. <laughs> uh, to put that in perspective, 16% uh, of Canadians uh, are convinced that Elvis Presley is still alive. Um, and th again, the Harris Poll Organization polled Americans and Canadians and asked them uh, about their views towards health care and responsibility for health protection, expecting to find that the reasons that we have such different health care systems are that Canadians are much more community-minded and socially oriented than we are. And what they, in fact, found was that identical proportions of Canadians and Americans favor a government-operated national health insurance program that the vast majority of people in both countries, almost an identical proportion, think that that system should be funded by progressive taxes, think that there should be no co-payments or deductibles for people at the time they're ill, and think that there should be one class of care in our society. In fact, the Harris Organization concluded that the only differences they could find is that the Canadians had political leaders willing to do what the people in Canada wanted, at least on this issue, and we didn't though I, I take uh, comfort in the fact that by most measures Canada's government is no better than ours. Their trains run no better, their post office runs no better than ours, and uh, a variety of measures of trust in government are no higher in Canada than here. And I guess one of the arguments that some have used against a national health insurance program is that uh, they're afraid that it would have the efficiency of our post office and the compassion of government agencies like the IRS and I guess the, the answer to that is that uh, if one is fearful of the efficiency of our post office in administering health insurance, uh, what would we think of turning over our post office to the health insurance companies? <laughs> you know, uh, we're not bringing mail all the way out to you. It's much too expensive to go out all the way out into the country. 35 million people without mail delivery.
uh, cutting them off as soon as they start to get too much mail and so on. <laughs> and um, so I think the case is uh, clear that we are in deep trouble. I, I think it's also clear that uh, we can easily solve it because of one happenstance of, of history that we've gotten ourselves in this very deep mess where we spend an extraordinary amount on medical care and that extraordinary amount is really enough to deliver high quality medical care to everybody in our country if we organized our system in a rational way and I guess the, the question is given this opportunity when we will quite clearly be changing our health care system uh, will we take a progressive step and uh, move to a solution that can actually stabilize the system for some time uh, or will we implement another what's likely to be failed reform? A Canadian friend tells me that watching Americans make health policy is a bit like watching a man perfect a poor design for a mousetrap. And um, the mousetrap design uh, that he takes along to a patent lawyer is a long block of wood and on it is painted a red arrow. And uh, at one end of the arrow is a, an old style razor blade and a piece of cheese just the other side of the razor blade. And the lawyer says, how does that work? And the man says, the mouse sees the arrow and he runs down the arrow to that razor blade and he peers over the razor blade at the piece of cheese and slashes his throat. <laughs> the lawyer doesn't think much of the design. He says, you need some modification there, some sawing action on the blade or something. And the man takes it back, works five more years on it and comes back with the block of wood and the arrow and the razor blade, but no piece of cheese. And the lawyer says, now how's that an improvement? And he says, well, you, the mouse sees the arrow and he runs down it to that razor blade. And he looks over the razor blade and he says, hey, where's my piece of cheese? <laughs> and that's the kind of redesigning that I fear we're hearing from Washington. But Winston Churchill said that you can always rely on Americans to do the right thing uh, after they've exhausted all of the other possibilities. <laughs> And we're getting close to that. So maybe we open it up to questions and discussion at this point. Will research and development be affected for better or worse under a single payor plan? Um, research and development is actually largely funded through taxes in the United States. Uh, the NIH budget and um, foundation grants overwhelmingly support medical research in this country and the funding for research is almost entirely a separate question from the funding of, of medical services. Our for-profit uh, drug and equipment firms fund a relatively small proportion of research and what research they fund um, actually uh, results in relatively little innovation uh, because for instance in the drug firms much of their funding now goes to the development of so-called Me Too drugs so that we have uh, eight drugs in a category uh, and a drug firm is anxious to develop a ninth so that it can have a patent uh, as its patent on previous drugs runs out uh, and that ninth drug often adds nothing new to the therapeutic armamentarium that we have. In fact, uh, between 60 and 80 percent depending on how one measures of total drug companies research goes for therapies that add nothing to our, our uh, therapeutic capabilities at this point. So I think the evidence uh, is pretty strong that there's not reason to fear a national health program in terms of our innovation. Now I think there are a variety of ways in which research and innovation could be improved from what we have now, but that's maybe a, a separate question that we um, shouldn't spend the time on at this moment. Let me just add to that, Ruth, if I may, but go back to one of the things that I spoke about, which is the nature of the priorities in the United States in terms of research and development. If you look at the entire federal government's R&D investment, 75% of that goes to military research and development. If you look at the research and development budgets of the European industrialized countries that are part of NATO, 25% of their budgets go to the military. So we're spending 75 percent, they're spending 25 percent. It's an example of, apart from the medical care system, in which indeed, as David has so clearly pointed out,
one could by eliminating the enormous waste that the insurance companies introduced, produce enough of the overage because of our extremely expensive system to deal with those who are not covered. But for all of the other kinds of issues, for education, for research and development, for, as I pointed out, public health, for social well-being, we need a decent society that funds these properly. Part of that is recovering some of the monies that we now spend for things that are destructive. Part of that is getting new social resources to deal with them. Transform our health care system to single payor. What would happen to the thousands of workers cur currently administering health care? It is, in, in military conversion, it has been one of the most important issues. Uh, I still remember, like it were yesterday, uh, standing in handcuffs uh, at the United States nuclear test site in Nevada and trying in my handcuffs to make conversation with the bus driver who was going to drive us to the place for our arraignment. And I said to him, uh, I'm sorry to create this problem for you that uh, all of the hundreds of us who are being arrested uh, have to be driven to the... the the who's gal, and he said, uh, I'm not sure that's the right Nevada term, but anyway, whatever term I used. And his response is, oh, don't worry. He says, I'm getting paid overtime for this. He said, uh, this is really quite wonderful for me. I said, aren't you worried about working in this place with the radiation and with the dangers? He says, sure. He says, I hate to work here. He says, it's a terrible place. He says, well, where else could I get this kind of pay? And I think the issue has got to be raised, as we've been trying to raise it over the years, uh, in terms of military conversion, it has to be raised as well for insurance company conversion. And fortunately, many of the people who work, for, not all of them by any means, but many of the people who work in these issues in insurance companies are trained to provide medical care. They're nurses, uh, they're physicians, some of them, they're others who could indeed uh, be put back to doing some useful work in the medical care system. And so what has to be done is in the course of that conversion, using those monies for the medical care that's needed for those not now covered, is those who would be put out of work. It's a very important question that was asked, that those who would be put out of work when the insurance companies are put out of business uh, be put back to work in the medical care system. Uh, let me just add that we, we take this very seriously. There are 2.4 million people employed doing administrative work in health care in the United States. Um, that's an enormous number. We don't need more than about a million. So we're talking about roughly 1.4 million people who need to be placed in useful work. And uh, we have a, a group within Physicians for a National Health Program that I'm now chairing that's working on, on the question of conversion in collaboration with the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union and several other progressive unions. So. Um, the, the, we're at least attempting to do more than pay lift ser, lip service to this, but to develop very concrete plans for how the, the work that's liberated from useless work can be used in a useful way in our society. How do you see mental health treatment fitting into the single payor system? Mental health needs at least as much overhaul, mental health services need at least as much overhaul as the rest of the health care system. We've had a group working on a design of a mental health component of a national health program for the last two years, and their plan we hope will be published within the next six months. Essentially, the, the concepts that guide the work are non-discrimination, that mental health services ought to be treated as other health services uh, in our society, that we need to end the um, the segmentation and inequality of care in that sector, which has been particularly um, disastrous with the sickest people shunted to the areas with the lowest amount of resources, the public mental health hospitals, and the least ill people often most attractive for the most skilled providers. We need to change the financial incentives and financing of the system um, to make care available based on, on need and uh, ability to to be helped uh, rather than the circumstances of uh, where you happen to live, uh, what your financial condition happens to be, and so on. Again, it's important to distinguish between mental health services and mental health. That is, clearly we have to build into whatever system is developed a proper kind of mental health service, which now is, I need not tell people in this room, uh, the condition 
uh, of the need and the condition of services for people who are in desperate need. But at the same time that we deal with the services, we have to ask some very serious questions about what is the nature of health in a society. And when you have people who are poorly housed and who are poorly fed and who have to live on streets in which there's gunfire all the time and we can't even get a Brady Bill through, I mean the weakest kind of gun control legislation, that's starting to build a mental health component in our society. Mental health services are also important, but we've got to do both. Would doctors' salaries be drastically reduced or controlled by a single payor? If you compare uh, primary care physicians in Canada and the United States, they do equally well in the two societies. Uh, if you look at specialist care, at least certain specialists in Canada do not do as well as in the United States. So in a single payer system, if it is patterned in a negotiated physician's income pattern as in Canada, there would be a flattening of the extraordinarily high salaries in the United States that go to certain kinds of interventional and specialists compared to primary care physicians. But uh, in general, uh, there would be a hopefully within that system, a rising of the incomes of the people in our medical care system who now do much of the work, uh, who clean the floors of our hospitals, who make sure that patients are transported from one place to another, who deal with uh, practical nurse care, a whole series of tasks which are badly paid in our society, and there has to be some leveling uh, of that economy uh, within the medical care system. Yeah, I, just to add, that Canadian physicians' incomes have almost precisely kept up with inflation since the passage of their program 25 years ago, and I think the expectation is that overall the average physician's income would approximately keep pace with inflation in this country, though as Vic has said, the uh, interspecialty differences would likely be attenuated. Uh, I think under managed competition, frankly, much the same thing is likely to happen. Um, the difference really is that for physicians, under managed competition, they become insurance company employees, and under a single payer system, they become public servants. And I think that's actually the, the choice that physicians um, face. We've been looking at wage data in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, Canadian healthcare workers other than physicians, on average, make wages uh, for nurses approximately comparable for other health workers, somewhat higher than, than U.S. wages. Uh, and we would expect that, again, within the, uh, the health delivery system as a whole, there would be something of an equalization under a single payer system. I think the evidence from the insurance industry is that if the, as the insurance industry takes over the health sector more and more, that the income inequalities would increase within that sector. So I would expect that the lowest paid workers would do worse under managed competition. The higher paid uh, would do probably comparable in the two systems. Do you both support the McDermott, Conyers, Wellstone bill? What are the major faults of the bill, if any? Dr. Hemelstein and Dr. Woolhandler have done a superb review of the draft of that bill. Uh, it surely has many of the features of single payer uh, that we've been working for. Uh, all funds are collected by the federal government. Uh, it is dispersed to the states uh, in a single payer fashion. Uh, uh, many of the other features of single payer are there. What uh, Himmelstein and Wilhandler have pointed out, however, in a strikingly important analysis, is that that bill permits there to be organizations of medical care within the states that are indistinguishable from private insurance companies in the sense that private enterprise can move in and organize the care and receive money from the single payer to provide that care. Uh, it, uh, David, I don't know whether David knows this, uh, last week there was a meeting of the New York chapter of the Physicians for a National Health Program, where there was a lively debate about what to do about this flaw that many of us perceive in McDermott Conyers Wellstone. Uh, we decided that until that bill was introduced, uh, that we would do everything within our power uh, to get that flaw remedied. That the instant it was introduced, uh, we would all work as hard as we could to try to support that bill while urging others within the Congress, both within the Senate, and we have some very good allies uh, within the House, 
uh, to produce amendments that would bring that bill closer to what we'd like to see. But for the moment, it is indeed, in most of its aspects, a single-payer bill. It deserves our support. It deserves our vigorous support. But as in everything else, which is less than perfect, we need to support it in the same time we have to work to change it. All of that I learned from David Himmelstein, so you might as well get it straight from the horse's mouth. Vic says it much more eloquently than I could, and that's why I wanted to him to go first. And I, I try to avoid giving uh, true-false answers to essay questions. Uh, and in my view, the, at this stage in, in legislation, it's an essay question. And the, the bill has a great deal that's good in it and some things that are bad. And um, at this point, it uh, is a very important symbol for the single-payer movement. Uh, we would hope that as time goes on, it will become a, a better symbol and a better crafted symbol. Um, so uh, I think Vic has laid out the, the principal issues on both sides of that for you. How does managed care fit into the proposal HR 1200? Fee for service leads to overutilization of services and inefficiencies. It has caused Canadian health care costs to rise faster than ours in recent years. Uh, I, I would actually disagree with the last part of the question, but agree with, with the rest. Canadian health costs, as a proportion of gross national product, have not risen faster than ours. They've risen much slower, and that's the right measure, because, in fact, as the society becomes richer, and Canada has been increasing in wealth much faster than we, average wages go up, and as a hospital, in order to maintain a workforce, you have to actually offer higher wages if the wages all around you are going up. So health care costs need to be standardized for the overall standard of living or gross national product in the society. But it certainly is true that fee-for-service medicine has inherently inflationary and, I think, conflict of interest elements. And I think most of us, uh, or at least many of us who advocate for a single-payer system, prefer personally uh, salaried medical practice. Uh, the McDermott Conyers bill uh, maintains a role for HMOs or managed care plans uh, and I think that's a, a positive. My problem with it is that it maintains a role for them even if they're for-profit plans and what that really means is that an insurance company runs a plan and its incentive is to enroll healthy people and not to provide them care to take the capitation fee that they would get from the, the plan and make a profit from providing relatively little care. The, the reason that's so important is that in any one year in our country, 10 percent of the population accounts for 72 percent of the total health care costs. And what that means as a health insurance program is that if you avoid that 10 percent of people, you will almost surely make a profit. And under a system that allows an insurance company to make a profit, we will encourage risk selecting, trying to enroll healthy people, because there are billions to be made. Just to give you an example, if you're prudential and enroll 20 million people, if you cut the number of cigarette smokers who you enroll by 5 percent, you stand to make $100 million because of that each year. That's such a powerful incentive for a marketing department that we don't think that any regulation can overcome it. So the regulation we'd like to see is that HMOs can't make a profit. They have to use all of the money that they get from the program to care for their patients. And at the end of the year, if they have money left over, then it goes back to the program or it goes to the patients. So that with that change, we think the, the uh, Conyers-McDermott bill would in fact provide an appropriate place for managed care and for salaried practice. Without it, we fear that the insurance companies will subvert the very good intentions of the bill. Let me just comment on that as well, and I want to step back and take a more analytic approach to that question. If you compare fee-for-service against basically prepayment, where the physician or group of physicians are paid a fee for the entire period of time for the care of a group of patients. In fee-for-service, and I hope the doctors in the audience will not take umbrage at this, I'm, I'm not referring to them, I'm referring to a profession which at times has seen this happen. If you have fee-for-service, clearly it is to your advantage 
to do more services because for every service you get paid for it. If you are in a HMO, in a managed care, we're not now talking managed competition, we're talking managed care, it is to a certain extent to your advantage, depends whether you make a profit or not, but leaving the profit issue aside, it is to a certain extent to your advantage not to perform services because you're paid a certain amount for that year and insofar as services are not needed or not provided, uh, that money is left over for and the best of plans for better equipment, for better services, for more patients, for preventive services, what have you. But there's a tension between the two. Some, like Arnold Roman, the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, has been uh, extremely eloquent on this, have condemned fee-for-service, says there is no place for fee-for-service whatever in a medical care system, and many of us see very clearly the logic of the position that he's taking. On the other hand, if you have a so-called managed care system, an HMO system, a prepaid system, you have to be very careful in the other direction. You have to be very careful that because the payment comes in at the front end, that there are appropriate kinds of controls within that system to make sure that patients and community are getting everything that they should be getting from that system. That means you've got to have ombuds people. It means you've got to have community participation in the organization of their services. It means that there has to be a, a, an observation, hopefully within the practice, but from outside as well, on services to make sure that every single patient being cared for is getting everything that that patient should be getting. The only point I want to make, I'm not arguing for fee-for-service, quite the opposite. I'm pointing out that there's a tension here and that within any kind of program that develops, we're going to have to look carefully at that tension and make sure that it's solved in the best possible way. And that's Alternative Views for this time. We'd like to thank our crew for helping make the program possible. Travis Goff, Erica Olivares, Kristen Thigpen, Trent Freeman, and Kelly Hope. They all provided editing assistance. We also are appreciative of Joe Friendly for letting us use his program with David Himmelstein on the healthcare situation. Joe has a plan three. Goodbye.